uh, I, I don't have notes <coughs> for this chapter. Because oh, yeah, was, to, to, to be expected. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was going to present. But I, I, I did read it and I did uh, I did finish the exercises. I, I find that, at least for this book, the exercises seems to be the more, more interesting part. Uh, at least that's where I have learned the most. So, because this chapter, we're dealing with only applications of what we covered in the previous chapter about building a, a basic website using HTML and CSS. And they really focus on this chapter, just applications of that sort of basic theory. So, because we don't have notes, maybe we can just uh, like implement the code and maybe have a little bit of discussion because uh, yep. I don't think there was, uh, I don't want to say improvements, but maybe different approaches that could have uh, been used for this, for this exercise, for example, for this first one, about counting the number of paragraphs in a page. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to, to copy the code. I think it's working. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, by the way, if someone is also using Node, you can install this module called Live Server. And when you activate it, as I just did, then uh, well, some HTML file will be seen, as you can see over here, via local host. And as you make changes to such page, and let's, maybe I can change this part, uh, another title. Then the, the view of the page gets refreshed instantly as well. So uh, that has been quite useful. So Lucio, is this is this equivalent to the? Um, I, I think I have the live server extension for VS Code. Um, oh, yes. uh, it does work equivalently. Okay. Got Maybe it, one it. is a wrapper of the other, but they, they are equivalent. Uh, just the I don't know, like the main advantage of calling this live server via the well, in this case via PowerShell is that you can call it. Not only from VS Code, but from any type of terminal. Good point. Okay, so this is the the page. It will have let's see a couple paragraph. This one, this one, an important part in order to to retrieve them. Well, I, I think this part wasn't explained, but when we use this function query selector or query selector all, this is string. Uh, what you put into it, it can be any type of selector that we are accustomed with CSS. So it's not only the basic tag name selector as we are doing with P to retrieve all paragraph elements, but you could do something like, uh, I know, maybe paragraphs that are of a specific class or that have some, or maybe something that has a particular ID. So, for this string, for this input of the query selector or query selector or function, well, you can use any type of CSS selector that you are accustomed to. So once we do that, we can see in the console that the number of paragraphs, uh, once we count it, it should get us to and just as of And let's see. Uh, then there is a note about using this inner HTML uh, property. Uh, let's maybe change this one, this code. And what it's going to do is now that we have a number of paragraphs look for an element whose ID is filled. In this case, it's this initial div that it, it seems empty. And again, we can do, instead of using this, the, and there is nothing wrong with it, but maybe just to show an alternative, we can use an query selector. And because it's an ID, and we're using CSS selectors, so we, we add this, uh, I know, hashtag. And now in this part, we're modifying the HTML of this field Deep, as we can see over here. And in this part, you could put 
any kind of HTML code, but as a string. And it will be, it will get re rendered in the, in the page as if such code would have been written over here in this field, inside the field element. Sorry. So now that I, have, I update the page, you can see over here that for this div, and this one over here, it has been updated with the code that we have defined and the number of paragraphs that we have also retrieved via this counter function. Uh, now, uh, in order maybe to spoil a little bit to what comes next in, in, a, in an exercise is, do we have to use inner HTML in this part? Because, uh, well, what sort of uh, HTML code are we using for this element? It's really just a string, number of paragraphs, and then some numbers. So it's uh, there's really not much HTML going on there. So maybe we could use also as an alternative text content. And now the outcome, as you can see, is exactly the same. However, there is a bit, a bit of preference over using text content over inner HTML. But we will discuss in a later exercise why one, uh, one, one should use one of these properties over the other. And it's, more, and it's mainly due to uh, an optimization because inner HTML happens to run a little bit slower. Uh, and there are more details, but for now, I will leave it at that. Okay. So now we take a look at the next example. We're going to create a table of contents. So we have some headers. Uh, we're assuming that each of them have some ID. So we will encounter these H2 elements with an ID attribute. And then we're going to be using this anonymous function that as, as soon as we define it, it is getting executed. Uh, there was a comment in, I think in one of the issues related to this book, well, in the in its GitHub repository of, why do we have to define a function and execute it right away instead of maybe yes, copying, well, using this code directly. That is not even bother writing this because it is going to get, it is going to get executed. Um, well, I'm not sure why this, would be the case that is finding an anonymous function and security in right away. But it does seem to be, uh, at least from what I have encountered by looking at the code of some websites, it does seem to be not common, but used. For example, um, if you have heard about what it is called Tamper Monkey, it is an extension. So that when you visit, you, when you visit a site, say google.com google.com sorry then once you visit that site some script that you have defined is going to get run so it could be something like oh customize that that page in this in that case google.com in a specific way uh, for example for here we can see that for this section if you want to define a custom script to be executed as soon as you visit some page well uh, the sort of structure to do that it's basically the, the same. That is, we use, we grab some function, well, we then define it and such. But after defining that whole function, the important part is this. You have defined it and then you are executing it right away. As we can see in this part over here, I don't know if it, it is this. One. this. So no, that's yeah, interesting. It, it, yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. So yeah, it does come up with sort of a structure. Um, of course, one uh, potential use of doing that. First is using this, what well, that is called a strict mode. Uh, I'm not going to go into that, but maybe I can leave a link. Yeah, Mozilla is always available. Uh, let's see. Uh, and another reason maybe that because you're, you're using a, <coughs> a different scope, than the global because you are inside some function. Well, then your variables declare over there, they are also local to that scope. So it's not like, it's not like this code is going to affect the, any of the global variables uh, because you have wrapped, it, wrapped them 
inside this function scope. If you had not written this, then it would have possibly crashed with some global variable. So I don't know if that, that's my that's my big, my best guess as to why uh, this sort of a structure uh, may be used. Now for the actual page, uh, it's the same HTML, sorry. I was looking for the HTML code. It's just the same structure that is different over here. We have some headers we can see over here. Header with an ID. And we are going to construct a table of contents based on those. So the code, let's see. It's precisely written. So let me insert it over here. I, I don't want to dive too much into the examples because uh, I want to make sure that we cover the exercises. They, so they do seem more interesting. So I probably skip one, one example or two. So now let's see. Again, we're retrieving this MTD. Then we're getting all of the H2 elements. And we're calling on these uh, methods from the array class in order to convert this into an array. And we basically do that because array have some sorry, arrays, have some special methods of their own. So in particular, we would like to use them for any type of list. Uh, sometimes if you use this query selector all, the the result is not an array but what it is called a note list sometimes you get something i think it's called html element list something like that so it is not quite an array but it does look like one but you want it to be an array so that you can use the methods of the array class and that, that's why we wrap it with this now we can use map uh, for this specific well array that we have already and um, over here, really, some main idea we have this header. So, for example, this one. And now we are going to define some text. It's going to be a HTML, but in text form. And that is simply a list item, then an anchor. And we are defining this href for this anchor so that when we click in that anchor, we get, well, the, the page is closed down up to this point, up to the position of the element that it is referencing. And now simply in the text for the anchor that we're going to click, we copy the same HTML that the header had. So in this case, we would be copying this exact same pattern. Now that we have this string of list items, uh, well, we can uh, concatenate those strings. So we use this join method well for the array because it's an array of strings maybe yes let me show a, a very basic example of that so maybe i define some array of strings so something like uh and then another element is a string so it's an array but if i use the join method you know i need to specify this character yeah all of the string elements get concatenated into a single string so that's basically what we are doing over here we're concatenating this uh, HTML code that it's, it's that is in a form of a string. And, and now that we have such code, then for this container that is this deep element, well, we have the list items, so they have to be inside of some kind of list. Uh, and for table of contents, we're going to be using this an order list. So we wrap it like this as the children, these items over here. The list items of the children of this and other list. And, and the outcome is what we would expect. Now we get this type of table of contents where, as we can see, the HTML, the HTML code for these list items is also the same as the headers that they are referencing because this has been emphasized via the EM tag. Uh, and the same happens for this. It's also emphasized. Uh, maybe we can look at it over here. This is the anchor, but it's also emphasized.
So let's see, I have one silly question. I, pardon me, because I didn't really, I'm, I'm, I'm presenting later today for another book club, but uh, so I didn't spend as much time um, on, on this as, as I should have. Uh, the, like the results, like after you, after you kind of concatenate things together with the join method, is the result still an array? Or, or is it a, a string? I mean, I mean, basically, I see that we're using like the string constructor afterwards. I guess I could do like type. I was asking because you got it queued up. I guess you do like type of and figure out. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. A string. Oh, it's a string. Okay. Got it. I think that even if you have some non-string element, maybe like a number two, it'll like stringify it. Yeah. To, okay. You know, string. Cool. Thanks. Okay, so we have these sortable lists example. Uh, well, really, I think it doesn't quite add as much. So let me check. Uh, well, maybe on this filter method, uh, it's basically what you would expect like in the, the peer library. We're only filtering the items that uh, match this condition. And then we'll be using for example, in order to obtain the nodes of some element, we can use this um, property. Uh, and by node, we we are talking about the representation of the of the HTML code. So this is all of this. Uh, as we saw, I think the previous chapter it is represented by a tree. So the elements of that tree are called nodes. That's why we are using this term, child nodes. And um, for example, if we uh, maybe let's go back to this particular header. If we select it, we are doing well. Which are its child nodes? As you can see it's this text node that contains the actual text for first, and this em element. And as we can see for the for the text node, it's just the text. And then for the other node, that is the EM element, well, uh, it's different. So uh, that's a basic idea. You retrieve the nodes of some element via this property. Uh, mm, well, maybe we don't have to quite mention this. There was a comment about this part. If you want to remove the children for a parent, uh, well, there are many ways to do it. So I wanted to share some of the approaches that one can take in order to achieve that. Uh, and for this part about, if we want to retrieve the child, sorry, the children of an element, do we have to use child nodes? Um, not always, because maybe you don't want all of the nodes, but maybe you want all of the elements. So for example, for let's see, for this F2 element, well, what could be if child nodes? We saw is this text and then this element. But if you want to retrieve only the elements of well the children that are elements, then we would retrieve, for example, for this one, only this one over here because it has a tag, it's an element. And actually, that's where I see used more of them, using children instead of child nodes. And then, ah, and then this the last part, that once you have some item, well, you can append a child into it via this method. So for example, I oh, know wait. Uh, no, it's okay. So we have this this header, uh, maybe we can retrieve some paragraph. Let's see, it is giving us this, with this one over here. So maybe now, maybe now I want, no, I don't want it. No, I want to retrieve the second paragraph that is this one over here. So in this case, I select all of them and, and I get the second one, so now we can see we have this paragraph now, or maybe to this header. Wait, wait, it would not be a child. 
Mm, no, maybe I'm skipping too much. I wanted to, to make use of the document create element in order to use a pen child, but no, maybe, maybe it's too much for now. In the exercise, will it still cover it? No. So over here, there's an important part of how to ensure that when you're running your JavaScript code, that for example, if it is trying to look for an element, as we have, as we have been doing over here, well, that such element can be rec recognized. Uh, in the first example, our, our code was the last child of body. So that, that makes sure that when such JavaScript code is getting executed, well, the other elements of the page have already been rendered into it. So you can access them, for example, via this type of function. However, in this, in this case, we are executing this script in the head, so before the body. So sometimes it can be the case that because it is getting executed before uh, the body has been parsed, that is, the browser can recognize the HTML elements that have been defined over here, so we can access them. Well, if that is the case, maybe when you're trying to access some element over here, such element, is the, it, it is still not stored stored in the memory of the browser, so you cannot access it. And there is, I think, when we do, yeah, when we do, when we execute this code over here, that is in the head, well, there is a problem that arises. So let us use it. I know, wait, this is another example. Uh, but it, it is important, I think. Okay, let, let's cover it, so. I, I, do, I don't want to show it because there was, I think, a mistake in the book. Yeah, they're referring to the ID instead of the class. Yeah, and yeah that was okay. confusing. So let's first look at this. It is just some lists. This, uh, let's see. I'm going to define the script, but I don't want to, to put it over here. I don't want to source it. I want to simply define it in this section. Um, copy a one from the book. And it is this one. And, and of course, the problem first is what, what you mentioned. It is referencing an ID. When we can see from the code, this, this list has a class, a class name sorted. So, we have to use dot for class. So when we do this, uh, let's see. Okay, so it is working. It is working fine. <laughs> and that is because I forgot to remove it. Okay, so now say we open this page, then it starts to get rendered from head. Well, sorry, from the start. Uh, getting red until the bottom part. So we, be, we, be, we begin with this, then this script gets red. Um, well, it never gets executed. So let's try to execute it. We, we have already defined function. So maybe let's execute this function. There is an indentation if you look here. Okay. So now we are going to sort these lists via alphabetical order. So we would expect something like, uh, four to be over here and such and such. Okay. Now, now it's working because it is not working in the sense that the list, they have not been uh, sorted. They have the same order. And, and that is because of this problem that when we are trying to access this sorted class, well, the browser still has not read this code. So there is no, there is no information about what is the element of class sorted. And, and the way they, they fix this in the book first is via using this part about the onload attribute of the body tag. Uh, and that makes sure that when the 
<coughs> when the load event fires for this tag, for the body tag, then this function is going to get executed. In this case, it's just executing the same function that we have defined. So now, when the body finishes loading, we will execute this function to sort the list. So now that we visit the same page, we see that they have been sorted. So it's working now. Uh, in the book, it didn't work because of this, as you mentioned. Uh, but they also provide a solution, and that is to use what it is called an event listener. And in particular, this type of event, the DOM content loaded event. So we're going to keep the same structure, but we basically remove this. So again, it should not work right now, you can see. But now we're going to make sure that this function is executed after this particular event has occurred. So when we repeat this type, this type of this type of structure. So then we define for the document. Uh, and the document, well, it is a module in order to retrieve many of the information about the page. As we have, we have seen, we can retrieve uh, elements of the page. We can retrieve, uh, and, and well, and other things. In this case, we are going to, to simply add an event listener so that when the HTML code of the page has finished. No, wait, let, let me check the official definition. I want to get mistaken about it. Okay, it's a the DOM content loading event triggers when the HTML document has been downloaded and the DOM tree has been parsed. That is this uh, tree representation of the elements, sorry, of the elements of the page. Uh, it has been already constructed and stored in memory. So when those two things happen, then this event will fire. So now, once this event fires, then we define a function to do something. And in this case, this function, what it will do, it will simply call upon this other function. Now, when we reload the page, we can see that now it has sorted a list as we expected. Uh, and this type of structure to do something once the don't content loaded event has fired, well, it's completely, well, it, it arises a lot when you're looking at a source code for fronted projects. However, I went to, I wanted to make a difference because we have in content in content, sorry, two type of events. One is the DOM content loaded, as we saw its definition uh, over here. When does it get triggered? But we also saw the other event, the load event. And um, well, when when does it get triggered? And we can see over here it says the load event triggers if all the resources have been downloaded, that is the HTML document, the images that you have, the style sheets and such. And uh, well, one, one may wonder, does one of these events always occur before the other? Uh, and the answer is that not really. There's, there tends to be a, a usual case. Uh, it's, in, uh, yeah, it's the same question also. There is one of these events that most of the time it happens to, to get triggered before the other, and that is the long count and loaded event. It usually occurs before load event, but as we can see in this example, the author provides a situation when that was not the case. So in that case, all of the resources of the page had been loaded, but still the DOM tree hasn't, hasn't, hadn't been parsed still. So you couldn't access some of the specific elements of the page. So the, over there, there is quite an issue, but in general, like as a safety tip, always use this event, dump content loaded. Once to, you have... to, to your knowledge, is there a way that you can sort of, <clears throat> I don't even, I don't even know if this will make sense in shiny, but um, to, to sort of say, 
once let's say a combination like only after a combination of events have occurred like that you know a condition that doesn't depend on a single event but on multiple events so something like do x if load event got triggered after dom content loaded well so i was thinking for example um you know trigger the event after dom content and loaded and after load load event so because in a sense like i guess you would probably want to have definitely the the dom you know uh, parsed by the browser but maybe you would also want potentially want to have the resources um downloaded too right before before you would kind of fire your 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 javascript does that make sense yes well there is ways to do that uh, like i hear mentioning like chaining events i know that jquery has some of those capabilities and uh, let's see nested well it's not really nested but on okay. i have used it but let's see No, this is not for it. Well, I will look for the code because I, I, I probably somewhere in my computer where I have used this type of nesting events that you are mentioning. But for this particular case that you said about load load event and don't content loaded event, you can also check if this event has already occurred. And that is by using the, I think it's called ready event. No. Well, I know where it is, but uh, let me think for two seconds. Uh, no, it's in. Uh, okay, once again, I have the code. I have used it. It's actually in the code that we are using for the, well, for the book club. What we define in order to make the, the JH chunks executable inside the page. So there is also a way to to do what you're asking. Uh, but I don't have the, the code right now. I think it's called document ready state. Yeah, I think this one over here. It, it, it has to do with this. Uh, I will share the code uh, later on. But what you mentioned, yes, it's, it's possible to to in a, in a way nest events uh, for look for a specific for a special condition that one event is occurring after another. Okay. Uh, then there is this part of a, well, there's this other example. I didn't quite like it, so I will ignore it for now. Uh, maybe let's, uh, this was interesting, uh, but again, well, let me see. Uh, maybe this part over here, or, or this one. So let me first show it. So I will copy the code into this page. And now that I visit that page, as you can see, well, the time, at least for me, locally is getting constantly updated. Uh, what we can get for this specific code is that we can use this in order to retrieve the current local time. And then once you have, once you have assigned such value into some variable, well, you can also retrieve the specific hours, minutes, and such. And then another interesting part is this one over here about the set timeout function. And what it's doing is that uh, wait, wait. Can you please set interval? Okay. And it's okay because it's calling itself. So it's what this function is doing is it set up some something to do. In this case, it's just a function. Uh, but then it also has an input of how many milliseconds will it wait? in order to execute this function over here. So in this case, in this case, 
for this function, we simply perform these operations and then we wait one second, that is 1000 milliseconds, and then we execute this function. But it is the same one, so it's getting executed again. And then indefinitely. Indefinite. There is also a set interval that you want to repeat some function after some number of milliseconds. And now for what I find is a more interesting part of this, of this book is the exercises. Uh, let's see, for the different exercise, we need to, to define a function that looks up the character encoding, encoding of the page and it will print it. So, well, for this, I can show the notes in the book. So what encoding is this? Well, we can use the document character set method in order to, to retrieve the encoding for the page. And say I want to execute such in, such method, sorry, such property into the, into the console, then we can retrieve the current encoding. And we can see, uh, well, I didn't specify one, but it, it seems to be the one by default. Then it says extend this function in order to look up all the meta tags in the current page and then print their names and values. And well, the meta tags, uh, they basically encode some of the metadata for the page, such can be, as we saw, the encoding. You can also encode the title of the page, the author. So it's basically like another syntax for where, where, what we are accustomed to in the YAML section of some R markdown or quarto document. And they are basically different sorry here. Let me retrieve some of them. These ones, they are defined in the head. We have the, car the character set. Uh, I don't remember what this does, the second one. But this, this one over here is basically so that your, your page works smoothly, smoothly also in mobile devices. So for the content to be, to be able to get the scale down uh, properly. So that you can still uh, read it comfortably comfortably if you're using a, a mobile phone instead of a desktop or instead of a desktop. So for this case, we, we simply want to retrieve these meta elements and get their attributes. So these, these things over here, their kind of properties. And well, the code for that, we can do the following. Again, we want meta elements, so we can use a query, query selector all. But then we want the attribute name, so we can use these functions. And then now that we have this name of the attributes, well, we can create like an object where we have the, the, the name of the key and then the value associated to that thing, another name for a key, and then its value, the, the particular string. And that's basically what we do over here. We store this name and value of attribute inside some object. So now we simply console log uh, such type of objects. So let's see, I, I will perform this inside this page. So I will just copy the code and then I will run the specific function that we have defined. As you can see, char set, UTF-8, we see, and the one over here. And that is precisely what we said. So really- Still, Silly question, Lucio, for the, for the last meta tag that, that you had, I mean, that's kind of like you're constructing a tag that doesn't exist. You're just, uh, you're providing key value pairs, right? Um, cause I guess there's not a default viewport tag. Um, for example, like the meta viewport? tag, there's a, the character set and this, so that's the, the name, the name and then the value, right? Is this yes. sort of like a way to like construct is like, okay, let's say that there's a, a viewport, let's create a viewport meta tag and you just have like name and content instead of, um, so you're defining the name and then the content is kind of like the, the value of 
Uh, yeah, yeah. A tag. Okay. Interesting. I'd never seen that before. Yeah, there are also many more properties for the meta tags, and they also get used in order for the for the. Uh, I don't remember the name for what Google uses in order to retrieve. Uh, well, when one uses uh, some question for Google, you maybe you know, look for pages that contain puppies. So you can include in your page some meta tag that has, I think it's called description. I don't know, but there is a property. So, that, so there is, uh, I don't know, let's, let's assume it's called property, this type of attribute. But over there, you can define some specific text. So that when, for example, when Google is looking for a specific page, it will read such text and get a clue of what is the content of your page. So it, it will perform a better guess if what the user asks ask for is really shown in the page that it is currently looking at. So over here we could we could we, we could have written something like app to showcase local time. <clears throat> and so if someone looks for this inside the well the Google search thingy. I, I remember the specific name. In this part over here, then this type of information will be useful to retrieve this specific page. In, in that specific scenario that we have asked for that type of information. But I, I remember what was the attribute. Okay. Uh, for this exercise word count. So we're going to count the number of words in the page. And we will do that by retrieving all the text notes. Then, and then we will then we will have to, to clean such data, like remove unnecessary void space and separate the words one by one. And then we can count the number of words. Uh, well, but there is uh, maybe some missing information because, for example, the style tags, that is where you define some CSS code, and the script tag, sorry, the, the style element and the script element, as we can see, for example, over here. Well, their text is, we can we cannot see such text inside the page. So we shouldn't really count this as the as our count for the number of words. However, we are being asked for the text notes in a page. And this element and also the style element, they do happen to be also text notes. For example, you can check that we are doing. Say we create some element. And in particular, it's a it's some script. So I will call the script. And this is the seven. As we can see, it is still empty. However, we can retrieve its note type. Well, it's just one, but I want to know if such type is also the type for the type particular to text notes. And that is, I think this one over here. Let's see. Text. Uh, note, text note. Yeah. Mm, okay, that's weird. Because in some implementation of this, when I was retrieving the text notes, uh, well, the script was being also retrieved and also the style. I don't, I don't remember the exact code that I used for that. I mean, it is an element note. 
but it also contains some text. As you can see, uh, whatever, right now it doesn't have text. Uh, so maybe that's why. Okay, so my point was that if the script did contain text, as we can see over here, then if you perform a simple selection of text nodes, then this element will have some text node, and there is this text over here. So it will also be retrieved as part of the works that we are counting. So we'll, we will just assume that we are not, we're not considering the style and the script tabs uh, for, the, for the work count. Uh, well, I included, I will later push into the repository for the book some ways to achieve the same using, well, what seem to be more efficient methods, but also I think they are using some specific methods that are going to get deprecated soon. For example, this one about three great tree walker in order, in order to iterate over the nodes of some tree, uh, as is in the DOM representation. Could could you also like um sorry I don't know how to do this in JavaScript but could you also just select the body <clears throat> so basically you, you like only look at the body element of HTML where you know I guess visible text would be yeah I have selected the body but we have all of its children and such well I would first share what well, it seems to be like an overkill solution that, that maybe doesn't work all the time. And it's doing basically what you say yes. So maybe for the document, uh, we are going to access this parent element, the HTML one. So for that, we use this over here. But now, as you mentioned, we only care about the text that it is being shown inside the page. So, well, what is that? Ah, well, I have to change that the HTML code because there is no HTML code. Uh, let's do something maybe even arbitrary. We just get some number of words over here. Uh, it's this one. Oh. It worked, okay. So let me remove this head. And for the body, I will be using this. So we have some content. And now what you say yesterday, we access the HTML element. And now if we only care about the text being shown in the page, this seems to work to access the text content. Uh, well, it didn't work quite nice. But if we do that, that is we're accessing this type of of works, then well, we can work with this with this string. In particular, what I did over here. Uh, let me open it. Not be a live server, but just as a simple page, and do the same. Which is the text content. Okay, so it it now works nicely, and as we can see well, we have the the CSS, the CSS code that I defined in this style tag over here. And then we simply, the text that is included in this part, and also the line breaks and such. But now we can clean, clean up such text. And what I did, well, when this wasn't over here, sorry, and it worked fine, is, as we can see over here, no, over here, sorry. And that is basically a, a simple cleanup using uh, regex. Uh, that I think that is for regular expressions. And for that, we did, let me check. Uh, this one over here. No, okay. okay. Document, document element, and then the text content. So we simply remove the plague lines. We are replacing characters using regular expressions. And then what character do we want to replace with? We remove like break lines. Uh, we remove unnecessary white space and then we separate the words. And once we execute it, it says we have 
15 words. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Oh, well, it's not working. So basically, when I tried what you suggested, uh, it didn't work quite right. So then I, I, I used another implementation, a little bit more robust in order to check if the note from which you want to access its content, if it is a style or a script. And that's basically what we have over here. There doesn't seem to be much time to mention all of this, but maybe an interesting thing that we can do, well, I already mentioned about using replaceable to make use of regular expressions. Uh, maybe if that it's a new method that we haven't seen. And for this, I'm simply converting some array into a one-dimensional one. So something like, this, as I flatten it, it becomes one dimensional. Got but it. now that I define this function and I execute it, that it count works. Well, I do get the expected result one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This doesn't count because this is, this is the alternative message for this image that, uh, that it is okay. not getting rendered. And we can see if I add if I add more words and I execute it again, then it is still counting them properly. So, so maybe for time, uh, well, later on, if you also find the time, we try to read some of the code in the solution because there are new things that I that I used and maybe they they will come up later in the book. So, oh, this yes, is really nice, Lucio. Okay, thank you. Just to finish up. Uh, yeah, just to finish up, only a quick comment about this part. I think it's over here. No, it's in this last section. I want to finish with that. Okay. And, and that is what I mentioned about why should one not use inner HTML? It's over here. So I will share the link. Um, well, there are many reasons why. One's, one is that uh, it, it can make some application slow down, but there are also some security concerns about it. So there are some type of attacks that can be done if you are using this type of property. Uh, many of them are outlined over here. So maybe also you can take a look later on. So uh, sorry for the rush presentation. Uh, well, I guess it's understandable in half time. Yeah, exactly. No, but I mean, honestly, it's super wonderful, Lucio. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, re always, always love your presentations because you, you go really deep and bring a lot of understanding, uh, to this. That's, uh, re really enriches the text. Oh, thank you. Mm, well, and with that, I think we can finish off. Cool. And I guess uh, next week, uh, then I'm doing uh, dynamic pages, right? Uh, yes, yes. And then we have visualization Visual. data. Yep. Do you want to do it or do you want me to do it? Uh, let me have a look. Let me have a look at the content first and other things on my uh, agenda. But yeah, I'll basically, I'll kind of look at the calendar and we can have a more um, even distribution, right? Um, so that it's... Okay. Well, uh, by the way, I am not. I will be no longer in the shiny UI UI book club for time reasons. Ah, uh, okay. But I, I I try to log in at least for your talk about SAS. Yeah, yeah. I need to <laughs> study up on that over the weekend. Actually, I I have uh, sort of tinkered tinkered with SAS a little bit, but uh, I need to to learn it a little bit uh, a little bit better. So it's a a nice opportunity to force myself to learn something I've been meaning to learn. Yeah. Okay, we'll see you Tuesday. All right, see you. Take Bye. care, Lucio. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye-bye.